I'm Cindy Kelly. Uh, this is Tuesday, August 9, 2016, in Berkeley, California, and I have with me Dr. Jeffrey Chu. And my first question to him is to say and spell his name. Jeffrey Chu. G E O F F R E Y. C H E W. Very good. So now we'll move on to uh, some harder stuff. You have, if you could uh, tell us um, when you were born and uh, and where, and a little bit about your own childhood. I was born in Washington D.C. Uh, in on June the fifth, nineteen twenty-four, um, I was the fourth child in a uh, family where the two parents, uh, uh, the father, they're both. The father was. Uh, fully English, I would say. The mother was already one quarter Burmese, which means that I'm one eighth Burmese. Um, but the Burmese connection was concealed from all the children <laughs> until late, later in, in life, the oldest of the four children made a trip to Europe and uncovered the fact, which was held to be, uh, di uh, you know, something that shouldn't be known. And the mother, my mother, refused to admit this when uh, her daughter came back. But it's further investigation is established that is true that uh, so I guess my her ancestry was um, puts her one fourth Burmese, one fourth French, one fourth German, and a little bit English. <laughs> um, Anyway, that's, and I didn't learn any of this until I was uh, adult, and uh, but uh, my my father was a uh, when I got to uh, communicate with him, discovered that uh, he was. He treated all his other three children rather roughly and disrespectfully, but he treated me very well. And uh, uh, he took me on many business trips with him. He was employed at the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, and he regarded himself an intellectual, which I guess was okay, was a reasonable statement. He was self-educated. He came to first to Canada um, when he was 17 without any even high school education, but he educated himself and eventually became a newspaper reporter while still in Canada, which is where he met my mother. And eventually they moved to the United States, where I guess all four of the children were born. I think it's true that my, f my oldest sister was born already in the United States. I'm not quite sure. It might have been in Canada. Um, so that's sort of uh, 
where I stood, and I got a lot of uh, favored treatment from my father, although I didn't much like my father because he treated my brothers and my brother and sisters rather roughly. But he was uh, he was a pretty smart guy, and he he wrote a book about uh, the importance of agriculture to the First World War. Um, and I th think it was titled something like Plowshares into Swords or something like that. Uh, and eventually I uh, got a scholarship at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And I remember my, my father wanted me to uh, b take an engineering degree because this was st still during the Depression and he never heard of anybody um, who called himself a physicist. Well, I didn't really know what physics was at that point, but he wanted me to do something economically useful in order that I could have a, a decent job. Jobs were so much on the minds of everybody still at that point because of the Great Depression that uh, the closest I could come was chemistry. It was agreed that uh, chemistry was sufficiently important to uh, to business that if you had a degree in chemistry you would you would probably be able to get a job and at George Washington University I had the extreme good fortune in my probably in my uh, junior year of taking a course from George Gamow who was a Russian theoretical physicist who had escaped to the United States uh, a few years earlier and who had a gift for teaching physics. Uh, so I enjoyed his courses some more than any of the chemistry courses that uh, I had, but I continued to, to suppose that my, I was going to get a degree in chemistry, but I kept on taking physics courses because they were more interesting. And, and then some, somewhere in the, um, during my first half of my senior year, that was in 1942, I guess. No, in the 43, yeah, and for, uh, 43. Um, a curious uh, event occurred that all my Students subsequently, my students subsequently, have claimed that this was crucial to my career. So, although I can't be sure, I, I will uh, tell the story. So, one of my sisters uh, was uh, aspiring to a career in art, commercial art. But she had a friend who had a, a college degree of some kind, um, who was a newspaper reporter for the Washington Post. And <laughs> uh, her, her, the name of this friend was Jean Craighead. And Jean Craighead uh, 
was to, uh, had been investigating as a as a f feature story in the post various cases coming before the board, the special board which had been set up. The war had begun at that point, that's important. So it was in their early part of the Second World War for the United States. Uh, there was a, a board that was set up to uh, consider possible increases in salary. Um, all salaries had been frozen during uh, for the period of the war, but there were exceptions made for special cases. And this reporter, Gene Craighead, uh, was getting interesting uh, material for a possible story. And she had come upon a a young uh, physicist, an experimental physicist, graduating from, I think, the University of Washington in St. Louis. And he had applied to this board for an increase in salary. As a graduate student, he'd been getting some relatively modest salary. Now he had his degree and he was applying for an increase, and probably a substantial increase. And what caught the uh, attention of this reporter, Gene Craighead, was that he was a nuclear physicist. And she wondered why anybody doing nuclear physics would be considered important to the war effort um, because, like my father, physics was not considered economically relevant. That, uh, people who studied physics uh, were not contributing you know, to the general economy, they were doing something very uh, abstract, interesting, but not useful, let's say. And so Jean Craighead was puzzling over this question, why would a nuclear physicist be considered important to the United States war effort? And she mentioned this to her friend, my sister, whose name was Ruth, Ruth Chu. And Ruth Chu said to Jean Craighead, well, of course, I have no idea, but I have a brother who is taking a course in nuclear physics at George Washington University. Why don't you call him up and ask him? Now, it happened that shortly before I received this telephone call, a class given by George Gamow, and by the way, George Gamow was never involved in any of the atomic uh, projects <laughs> which um, uh, came to be called the Manhattan Project and all of that. Why? Because he had left behind his family in Russia when he escaped. And United States intelligence, Army intelligence, inferred correctly, it turned out, that Gamow would be subject to pressure from the Soviet intelligence, and at that point, uh, the United States policy was not to let the 
Soviet government know anything about the Manhattan Project. Of course, I knew nothing of this at the time. But George Gamow, uh, giving a class in nuclear physics, which I attended, explained that this process called nuclear fission had been discovered just a few years before and that it opened the theoretical possibility of an atomic weapon that would be much more powerful than any that had heretofore been possible. And he said that it was probably good for the world that such a weapon was not practical because it required a isotope of uranium that was extremely rare, that the common form of uranium did not undergo fission and that uh, it didn't seem as if there was going to be enough of this fissionable uranium to ever build anything uh, practical. So uh, when uh, Gene Craighead called me on the phone and asked me if I had any idea about why the United States would consider nuclear physics relevant to the war effort, I told her what Gamow had told us. And, and then I forgot about it. But shortly thereafter, on a Sunday morning, I remember, I got a, a telephone call from someone who wished not to be identified, said that he would like to have a confidential meeting with me and he didn't want anybody else in my family to know about it. And of course, this was a completely astounding to me, but I said, okay, if you come to the front door of the house on such and such a time, I will let you in and then I'll take you upstairs to my bedroom and we can talk up there and the rest of, the, of my family need not know that you're in the house and this was what happened. So we started talking in my bedroom upstairs. And at first, he was trying not to reveal anything to me, but just to find out whether uh, what that I later figured it out that when that morning, the Washington Post had carried a feature story by Gene Craighead with a picture, <laughs> with a, a drawing going with the beginning of the story, which showed an atomic bomb exploding over Berlin. Um, uh, that uh, he had called, the, uh, the Army Intelligence had immediately called Jean Craighead and asked her uh, how she got this information. And they were presumably assuming that somebody within the Manhattan Project had given her the information. And she said, oh, no, she said, she just uh, based it all on this conversation she had with a friend of her bro uh, of uh, of um, with a with a brother of her friend, and I at the beginning of the conversation with the army intelligence man, I could tell he was skeptical of what she was telling him, because I was. Uh, I don't know, I was 19 years old and uh, obviously had no contact with any 
anybody in the Manhattan Project. Uh, but I told him, well, whatever she had to say about nuclear fission in the article was accurate and it was consistent with what uh, George Gamow, my teacher, had told his class and that was the information I had passed on to her. Uh, and uh, I remember that when I realized that her article had appeared in the morning paper, I went downstairs leaving the uh, Army Intelligence man upstairs in my bedroom looking for the article and trying not to let anybody else in my family know what I, what I was interested in. And eventually I located a copy of the uh, article, brought it upstairs, and I read it in front of him, uh, of the intelligence man, and I said, yes, that's consistent with what I told her and with what Professor Gamow had told us. And, well, that was the end of that story, as far as I was concerned. I had never heard anything more directly about it. But, shortly thereafter, uh, George Gamow took me into his office and he said, and I can't remember the precise sequence of of this, but he said, um, I have a friend who was a faculty member here at George Washington uh, uh, until recently, whose name is Edward Teller, who has written to me asking if there are any graduating seniors uh, who might be suitable for coming to work for the project that he is working for. And at that point I had already, without understanding what I was doing, accepted a, uh, a, an offer from another <laughs> branch of the um, Manhattan Project, which was in New York, and I think related to Columbia University somehow. But uh, Gamow said, I told Gamow this, and he said, oh, he said, what Teller is doing is much more interesting than whatever is going on in, in New York. <laughs> and he said, uh, you should by all means go and work with Teller. And, well, at that point, I was 19 years old, and uh, I accepted uh, Gamow's uh, recommendation, and uh, I can't remember exactly what I had to do to accept it officially, but uh, um, anyway, I was... As soon as I got my degree, uh, fin yeah, as soon as I'd finished uh, the work for my degree, which was the middle of the year because I'd been taking more classes than needed to build up the credits. So in uh, just at the end of 1943, I got and I wish I could remember the details, but uh, I was put into communication with somebody at the University of Chicago. And the instruction was that I would take a train from Washington to Chicago, and I was not told where I would end up, but I would wait in the railway station where the train deposited me and somebody from the University of Chicago would come and give me 
a ticket that would take me to my destination, which was not Chicago, but I was not told where it was. And I can remember uh, sitting in that railway station for several hours with nothing happening. And then eventually, a somebody came over to me and said, is your name Jeffrey Chu? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, I was looking for a Chinese person. Turned out he'd been waiting there for two hours because he assumed that anybody with the name C uh, Chu was Chinese. But he handed me a ticket and the ticket was to take me to, on the Santa Fe Railroad, to a station called Lamy, which was not Santa Fe itself, but a short distance away from Santa Fe. And uh, so I got on this train, and uh, I can't remember whether it took I can't remember exactly. <laughs> At least one night was spent on the train, and I think there was a, another, at least two other young men, I think, c coming from Harvard on the train with me, and also descending from the train in Lamy. And when I got off the train in Lamy, I was met by somebody that I had never seen before, who introduced me to himself as Edward Teller. So that was my first encounter with Edward Teller, getting off the train. In the, I think it was in the pretty late in the, in the day. It was dark, and. He then drove me to Los Alamos, and I can remember being very nervous because the road crossed some precipitous terrain along the sides of cliffs and so on, and this individual, whom I'd never met before, who was speaking with a, an accent that was not anything I had ever heard before, um, and was intense. And he was trying to bring me completely up to date during that drive on what had happened up until then in the Manhattan Project. And I, I can remember that he scared me because he would keep looking at me uh, while driving, and I was afraid he was going to run over the side of, of a ravine, but he didn't. And during this uh, uh, drive from Lamy up to Los Alamos, one of the uh, points that he emphasized well he he told he he, he tried to emphasize, you know give me the whole story just during that drive but he said that the big emphasis just at that time was on an idea that was related to another uh, hungarian a mathematician named von Neumann. And I had experienced contact with von Neumann in Washington, D.C. earlier, and uh, but that, that contact had nothing to do with the Manhattan Project. Um, 
But it, what I was told by Edward Teller was that um, largely because of von Neumann's um, influence, a way of exploding an atomic, uh, a nuclear fission-based weapon was being emphasized at Los Alamos, and this was the the uh, the fat the fat boy or something where you implode circularly, and so. I encountered von Neumann's name for the second time in my career during that scary drive from Lamy up to Los Alamos. At, at Los Alamos, I was working as an assistant to Teller. Um, and the I didn't know this at the time, but he was he was uh, pursuing an idea that emphasized not nuclear fission, but instead fusion. And uh, the director of the laboratory, Oppenheimer had decided that the idea of fusion was too far distant. I mean, it was just so undeveloped that it wouldn't compete for priority with the, um, with the nuclear fission. So, uh, but he allowed Teller to carry on research in on the fusion possibility with a a team of which I was one member, and the other two members were also students from George Washington University, but ones who had known Teller while Teller himself was a teacher there. And uh, so his little team at that point consisted of of the these three um, all students from George Washington University, and we sat and just punched hand computers. Um, the electronic uh, computers didn't exist at that point. And uh, so that's how I got introduced to the uh, Manhattan Project. Now, during the um, during the uh, remainder of my time at Los Alamos, I guess I stayed there until spring of 1946, so I must have, yeah, I guess I was there for a little more than two years, I guess. Um, I did, my, my assigned jobs were always just punching hand calculators and I didn't really learn any quantum theory uh, until the war ended and the last four months or so at Los Alamos turned that place into a university. They had probably the most distinguished faculty of any uh, physics faculty of any <laughs> any school in the history of the world. Um, 
which included Enrico Fermi, and I had the good fortune to um, be Fermi's uh, teaching assistant, which was crazy because he was teaching a class in nuclear physics, and I'd never had a class in nuclear physics, but I was supposed to be grading the papers of the other students. But of course, I was just as much of a student in, in that group as anybody else. And uh, I had gotten to know Fermi during my two years uh, in Los Alamos. And that turned out to be uh, crucial to my career because uh, after the war, when it uh, there was no uh, there was no uh, question that I was going to be following Edward Teller to the University of Chicago. He was not going to return to George Washington University in Washington D.C. He was going to go to the University of Chicago. And Fermi already had a connection with Chicago, and he was going to be the big star of their physics faculty. And so when I arrived uh, at the University of Chicago in 1946, I guess, um, although I was nominally a Teller student, a little bit later, not very much later, but uh, Teller came to me one day and said, Fermi, because the new cyclotron here at Chicago isn't going to be ready for him to use for another year, that he wants to take on a couple of graduate students and and catch catch up on various developments in nuclear theory. And Teller, Teller said, uh, would you be interested in switching from my supervision to his supervision? And uh, I was overjoyed because for various reasons uh, at that point, uh, I was uncomfortable with uh, Teller as a teacher. Uh, I had enough experience with Fermi as a teacher to know that he was far, far superior in that capacity. And so I, I switched over to, uh, to Fermi, and that ended my formal connection to Edward Teller. But there's no, no doubt that uh, the foundation of my career in, in, um, in physics began with Teller and, of course, depended on his relationship to, to Gamow. So it was Gamow to Teller to Fermi, so far as I was concerned. And Fermi was an unbelievably talented, effective teacher. He um, I, I was just lucky. Uh, the sequence of developments just were wonderful for me. So that's, that's the end of my direct connection with Los Alamos. But uh, there's one story which I certainly I remember this keenly, uh, which probably is irrelevant to, uh, to all of this, but and it is that uh, in... <clears throat> July of 1945, 
I'm not sure whether I've been keeping my dates correct, but all of this has been happening during the mid-40s. I got to Chicago, University of Chicago in 46. I got my PhD in 48. And then I came back to Berkeley in 48, I guess, in the fall of 48. But uh, in the middle, two-thirds of the way through the Los Alamos period, because Oppenheimer had a policy which was quite remarkable that anybody in the lab who had a white badge was uh, considered okay to talk, you know, there, there, there was no information withheld from anybody who had a white badge. And uh, I had a white badge. So I went to lots of meetings and heard about how things were developing, even though the stuff that Teller that was assigning to his three assistants had nothing to do with the uh, first atomic weapon. I heard at these meetings what was going on with the uh, development of the of the first nuclear fission device and knew the date of the of the test in July of uh, 1945, which was in between the end of the European War and the Pacific War. So the war was still going on, there was still security, but um, um, it was all the white badge people at the lab knew when the first test was going to be made and uh, I was not involved in this actual first test but extremely curious of course about what, whether it would work or not and a, a group I think uh, the, the, these three assistants to Edward Teller uh, and, and maybe one or two others that we were close, close to, we arranged to, on the evening before the test, to drive to the top of a mountain close to Albuquerque, which was still about... 80 miles north, I think, of the site where the test was to be held. But uh, there was a, a mountain there. I forget the name of the mountain. But it was a popular tourist site. You, you got a beautiful view of all the surrounding country from the top of the mountain. So we, we drove there with our camping equipment, bed rolls and so on, the evening before. We knew the scheduled time of the test, which, I don't know, 4.30 in the morning or something like that. And uh, <laughs> I remember that uh, on the top of the mountain, we were not the only ones from Los Alamos uh, coming to see the great event, or the hoped-for great event. And the funny thing was that this group of, of uh, people from Los Alamos camping on the top of that mountain on that night, 
were being scrutinized by security officials who came around and checked with everybody there <laughs> that they had the appropriate uh, Los Alamos white badges. <laughs> it was really a weird uh, situation. And it became even weirder because we got up very early because of the scheduled time of the test and all sat in a row looking toward the direction where the test was to be held. And the scheduled time, whatever it was, 4.30, came and went, nothing. So we waited for at least another hour, hour and a half, and we didn't know what had happened. And finally decided, oh, well, I guess it didn't work or something went wrong and we didn't know. So we started putting our uh, sleeping bags, you know, packing them up and getting ready to go back to Los Alamos. And I think my back was turned to the south when suddenly the sky lit up. And there was this incredible uh, flash. And of course, everybody turned around and watched and saw this uh, mushroom cloud business, which has become so famous. And then, I forget how long it took, but the sound took quite some time to get there. I could figure it out, I guess, but it was a very significant interval before the, the sound of the explosion reached us. And then I remember after we had packed everything up and gotten back in the car and started down the mountain, that we started to speculate about the impact on the world history from all of this. And we were, we were very much aware that it was an important development in the history of the world and... Can you, um, everybody's always interested in Oppenheimer. Do you remember being in one of the colloquia with him and what he was like? Uh, or any others of them? These, uh, at that point in my life, I did not have I can't claim to have had direct contact with Oppenheimer. Um, I did not know that uh, conflict between Oppenheimer and Teller had already begun and that uh, I was somehow I, I don't know the details, but uh, Oppenheimer uh, distanced himself from Teller, I believe, partly by allowing Teller to have his, his own little group of assistants. And, uh, and then Oppenheimer pretty much ignored whatever that group did. He did not consider it significant. It was just an administrative device to, <laughs> to get Teller out of his hair. Uh, and when, after the war, 
and uh, I had gone through a sequence of personal uh, displacements that uh, didn't didn't have any direct connection with Teller, but they brought me back close to the University of Chicago, not not in Chicago, but in the middle of the state of Illinois, at the University of Illinois. Uh, I spent six years there. Uh, after having first been appointed here in Berkeley in 1949, I guess, I'm trying to, you know, 49, um, I left Berkeley and went to Illinois not because of Teller, because Teller was not in direct contact with me at that point, but because the uh, faculty here, the physics faculty here at Berkeley, became badly split over the what's called the loyalty oath controversy. Um, and during during this period, um, there were all sorts of ugly things going on. Having to oh, there's one little relevant. Not, oh yeah, one of the um, Soviet uh, spies inside Los Alamos, whose name escapes me at the moment, but he's famous. Fuchs? Fuchs, yeah, Klaus Fuchs. He actually lived in the same dorm in Los Alamos that I did. And I had no direct contact with Fuchs. I, I, I knew he existed, I heard his name, but I don't know what he did when he was at Los Alamos. Well, I was just using his name to characterize this painful period after the end of the Second World War when there was this intense anti-Soviet um, feeling in the United States, I, as I say, I, 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 saw, I saw Klaus Fuchs, I may have even spoken to him, but I have no recollection of that or of anything, any meaningful exchanges between us. Um, I was, of course, as unaware uh, as anybody else at Los Alamos, who was not actually uh, con in contact with the Soviet uh, intelligence, um, of the fact that there were intelligent uh, Soviet agents there. Um, Now, I'm trying to connect this confusion in my mind. I was, for most of this period, uh, at the University of Illinois. I, I, uh, I went there in, I guess, 1950, and I stayed to 1956. I was there for six years. <clears throat> And during this period, during a large, a large part of this period, I remember 
continuing to hold the, the security clearance, which uh, was essential to the people working at the Manhattan Project. Um, and there were occasions in which Edward Teller um, took advantage of, of that clearance to have me accompany him to various other related activities. Uh, now I can remember, let's see, th three I can remember perhaps. One was when I think largely because of his efforts, the Livermore Laboratory became established. He had me spend a, a large portion of a summer working at Livermore. And I can't remember what it was that I worked on. Um, at that point. There was another occasion in which um, he took me with him to a uh, location in Florida where uh, a um, a missile was to be launched for some reason. I can't remember the details of that. Um, I can remember that there was uh, this extension of my security status that allowed me to see occasional glimpses of the uh, activities that were obviously <laughs> being directed uh, to a possible war with the Soviet Union. Um, and then um, then there was another somewhat more pleasant summer that somehow I think it also involved Livermore, where I, I was involved with uh, two colleagues, one of whom had been, I'd been, in, uh, well, he was, he was the second student that theoretical physics student that Fermi took at the University of Chicago, uh, of which I was the first, and this friend, whose name was uh, Marvin Goldberger, was the second. And then there was a um, a um, Another man who was, I think, four years older than me, Goldberger, I think, was one year older than me, and this other man was four years older than me. He had nothing to do with the Manhattan Project at all, but he had been in the regular army during the Second World War. Um, but the three of us got involved in a summer project that was somehow related to Livermore. And it was, it had to do with the controlled fusion energy, not as a weapon, but as a source of uh, energy that might be competitive with uh, other 
energy sources. Um, and I guess because Teller's name and Livermore were closely associated in my thinking, I, I, I somehow involved Teller's name in that summer also. Uh, but what I do remember <laughs> is that uh, Teller was always... Uh, Teller himself had moved from Chicago to California. I think he was on the regular faculty here. But he devoted more and more of his attention to Livermore. And he was constantly trying to get me to come back to Berkeley. And I can remember being uncomfortable always because of the conflict that had come to public attention between Oppenheimer and Teller. And during this post-war period, I had had contact with Oppenheimer, which I did not have at Los Alamos. But after the war, at the Institute for Advanced Study, I did have some contact with uh, Oppenheimer. And um, somehow the publicized conflict between Oppenheimer and Teller uh, rankled me <laughs> more and more, and I just did not enjoy contact with the, or enjoyed it less and less. Uh, as time went on, um, and I felt embarrassed by it because Teller had always been very kind to me, never done anything to hurt me, always seemed to be anxious to do the best for me, but his conflict with Oppenheimer made me uncomfortable. And of course, I, I was getting less and less interested in uh, weapon <laughs> issues and more and more interested in really uh, more foundational scientific issues. Anyway. Uh, during that six-year period at when I was at Illinois, Teller was constantly trying to get me to come back to California, and I was always finding excuses not to, because I did not want to get back into the position of being a, a protege of, of Teller. Um, and then finally in 1957, I took a sabbatical leave from the University of Illinois, spent half of it here in Berkeley, and during that period discovered that there were many members of the Berkeley faculty here who shared uncom my uncomfortable feelings about Teller, sort of wished that he would go away because he was he was so political, and uh, academic issues were the, what they were interested in. And anyway, they organized without Teller's knowledge my return here in 1957. Um, but there was a period uh, when we overlapped here, uh, as members of the faculty, I guess. 
And I can remember that I was always uncomfortable about that. <laughs> I never was on a close personal relationship with Oppenheimer. He was interested in some of the ideas that I was proposing, but um, so I'm trying to, I suppose, uh, the relationship to the Manhattan Project is the main thrust of this set of reminiscences. Um, I have a vague recollection of some occasion after the war, but not terribly long after the war. I can't remember exactly how long of a celebration at Los Alamos of some kind in which <coughs> Teller showed up and Um, another theoretical physicist whose name I momentarily cannot resurrect, but one whom I had gotten to know pretty well, also showed up. And I can remember being present at a, what was really a social occasion in which uh, this other guy refused to speak to Teller in a public situation. And it was the uh, strongest example I ever saw directly of the antipathy to Teller that had developed uh, in the scientific community. And uh, I can remember being terribly embarrassed because the idea of refusing to speak to Teller was something, you know, I couldn't do. I, um, um, and this other guy, I was on friendly terms with him and to see him in public uh, exhibit this uh, anger, I guess you'd say, his anger toward Teller was shocking to me. Was this after the security um, trial? The, the security clearance trials? Yes. Was after that? It was after that, yes. yes that, that was... I think that was the uh, uh. <laughs> so I've had a very confused relationship with with Teller. So what about in, at University of Chicago, where you got your PhD, you? were Enrico Fermi's student? Well, I began as Teller's student, but I did not get my degree as Fermi's, uh, as, Fermi's uh, as somebody supervised by uh, Teller. Yeah, I, I switched to Fermi, and I don't know to what extent. Uh, Fermi was also at Los Alamos. I don't know. To what extent you're interested in uh, recollections about Fermi? Sure. Well, um, I remember already at the Los Alamos period uh, that Fermi had a, an unusual personality, very, very different from Teller, totally different from Teller. But an example of it, he was he was tremendously competitive. <laughs> 
in all ways. And uh, an embarrassing occasion was that uh, in this intervening period between the end of the European War and the ending of the Pacific War, uh, I got married, brought my wife to Los Alamos, and we had we were given an apartment, or you know we were allowed to live in an apartment, and. Somehow, I can't remember why, uh, developed a social relationship between um, oh yes, I, now I get it. The, um, the two other f Teller students who were part of this three-person three team that were Teller assistants uh, they were married. That was a married couple. And the wife in that couple <laughs> was very social. She was always organizing social things. Matter of fact, I've got some wedding presents from her st sitting upstairs in the house. And I realized that, yeah, the, those were given to me, gi given to my wife and me by. Uh, this uh, individual and uh, so there were lots of parties they had lots of lots of parties and we went to enough of these parties that at some point we thought well we ought to give a party ourselves and uh, so uh, my first wife and I arranged a very very uh, <laughs> sedate party for people that we'd come into social contact and among them were Fermi and his wife and and these parties were so benign <laughs> that they would often play uh, uh, party games at them uh, and one of the games which was proposed, uh, he put all the people attending the party see, seated in a, in a circle. And um, um, and then and then there were some people in the circle who knew the secret that was the basis of the game. And the game was that you passed some object, and I think it was a pair of scissors, but it probably doesn't matter what. Uh, you passed the pair of scissors from one member to the next, and you and you say, I passed the scissors crossed, or you would say, I passed the scissors uncrossed. But uh, the, whether it was crossed or uncrossed was, became immediately evident. It didn't have to do with, well, okay, all right, all right. Uh, the game was to figure out what was the distinction between passing the scissors crossed or passing the scissors uncrossed. And so the people that didn't know the game were watching what other people did and were supposed to figure out what made the difference. And uh, it was a happy little game, and uh, uh, Fermi and his wife were part of the circle, and, and uh, after a while, 
the only member of the circle that hadn't figured it out was Fermi. And because my wife and I were the hosts of the party, oh God, I was getting so embarrassed, you know. And Fermi was, was doing all sorts of systematic things. He said, okay, you hold them this way. Or you hold them this way, or you hold them this way, <laughs> or you hold them that way, you see. And everybody else had figured out what the answer to this party game was, but Fermi couldn't figure it out. Oh. And, uh, uh, Finally, I can't remember, I, I, I was getting more and more embarrassed, you know, because he was so intent on figuring it out. Well, the, uh, the answer was that if your legs were crossed as you passed the scissors, then you say they crossed. If your legs were not, and everybody else had figured it out, but not fair me. And oh, God, I was embarrassed. And his wife, I remember, uh, was also getting disturbed. And shortly after, uh, uh, somebody had to explain it to Fermi, you know, that, oh, God. Uh, <laughs> and Fermi, very shortly thereafter said it was time to go home, you know, for him. <laughs> and he, he seemed, he really was upset, you could tell, you know. Oh God, what a moment. So that's one of my, one of my recollections from Los Alamos. Uh, <laughs> but he was very competitive. That was one of the funny things about him. And of course, as a physicist, he was hard to beat, but uh, there were all sorts of other things. And he did all sorts of activity. He would play tennis and, and climbing. And, I rem uh, and when we were at Los Alamos on weekends, after Saturday noon, I think you were, you were allowed to go off and walk in the hills and the mountains, really. Um, Fermi was very proud of his climbing, how, how not, uh, it wasn't uh, mountain climbing, but it was, uh, you know, how, how long could you keep going before you became exhausted or something like that. And he was very strong and proud of it, you know. Uh, so I, I had plenty of opportunity to observe this nature. Um, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so that was a Los Alamos memory of Fermi that I carried away. And when I became his student at the University of Chicago, I saw it. Uh, I, I saw another side of him, which. At the time, I accepted, and it's very much related to a, co a conversation you and I were having not long ago. Uh, that he despised philosophers. He thought philosophers were just totally use useless. Um, and so I, as I've gotten older and older, <laughs> I've recognized that Fermi was, uh, had weaknesses, you know. Uh, and he would, I could not expect him to understand what I'm trying to do now. It would be absolutely impossible. Um,
um, he used mathematics a great deal, but it was always as a practical tool, not as a way of expressing what, what mathematicians would, would call uh, something being correct or incorrect, you know, mathematical sentence, it's either true or it's false. Fermi didn't care about that side of mathematics. He, he somehow used mathematics as a, as a practical tool without caring about whether something was true or false. For him, everything was approximate. He couldn't imagine that there was any any meaning to uh, to, to the uh, absolute truth or absolute or well. <laughs> so it's a very strange thing that uh, Fermi, whom I, as a teacher, he, I revered him in the most the early part of my career. I did it in the spirit of Fermi. I didn't pay any attention to the math pure mathematical ideas. And now here at the end of my life, uh, I'm trying to do just the opposite. <laughs> um, but what has this got to do with Los Alamos, except that that's where I met Fermi, and I wouldn't have ever encountered him had it not been for Los Alamos. Um, I was extremely fortunate in uh, the way they, things developed. And my students, quite a number of them, who've looked into this Gene Craighead story, one of my students checked me out. He couldn't believe the story as I told it. So he actually contacted Jean Craighead and asked her directly, and she verified. And uh, as a result, in a book of memoir or me something or other that was, that was uh, created at the time of my 60th birthday, I guess, so some of my students got together, had a celebration of my 60th birthday, then they put together a collection of articles. One of them, the one that did this research with Gene Craighead, includes the details of that story uh, in it, and he verified all the details, more so than I ever took trouble to do, because he, could, he didn't quite believe it. Um, but she verified it, and uh, so it's it's actually written down in that little book. <laughs> oh well, oh my! And uh, I guess I can say that without Los Alamos, uh, I probably would have. Well, I, I certainly would have had a totally different life would never have enjoyed so many of the remarkable uh, events that occurred. It was a strange period, very strange. Oh, and this student, yeah, this student is convinced that I was sent to Los Alamos to get me out, you know, to get me behind the security barrier, that that was the reason that, uh, but I can't connect it up with Teller communicating with Gamoff and, and then Gamoff telling me what, he didn't know, I don't know whether he even knew the word Los Alamos, but he said, Teller, uh, Gamoff knew pretty well what was going on. And he told me that it was going to be much more interesting there than any place else. Um, but this student came to the conclusion that I was sent to Los Alamos to, 
button me up, you know, so I wouldn't be stimulating any other newspaper reporters to <laughs> to write stories with pictures of atomic bombs exploding over Berlin. That's great. <laughs> You were, were talking earlier, too, about uh, knowing Johnny Van Neumann. The first time I met Van Neumann was uh, about a year before the Los Alamos, uh, my being sent to Los Alamos, when I was assigned to assist him with some work he was doing for the Navy Department uh, based on his uh, hydrodynamic uh, capabilities. Von Neumann was capable of all sorts of remarkable things. And uh, uh, so I was assigned for summer a summer job, afternoons on I don't know how many days a week. Uh, I would walk over from George Washington University to the Navy Department building where von Neumann was working on hydrodynamical questions related to the Navy, not to the atomic bomb. <laughs> but just having to do with how water flows. And I was, because this was before the electronic computers, uh, I was assigned to be his manual human computer, and I would just punch keys and then uh, translate the outcome of my punching to uh, graphs that I would construct. And I knew nothing about the mathematics he was using, but I would sit there punching out numbers and translating them into curves on sheets of paper and von Neumann would pace around the room totally out of contact with, there were other people in the room, things going on, but he just disconnected himself completely, and I'd never seen a human being doing that before. And as he went around the room, as he passed me, he would stop, stare at the curves that I was generating, and then go on pacing. <laughs> so that was my first contact with uh, von Neumann. Then the second one was this drive from Lamy to Los Alamos in the dark, with Edward Teller telling me that von Neumann had s somehow persuaded That pro I guess it must mean uh, Oppenheimer, that this uh, circular, spherical uh, implosion <laughs> was, a, was, a, was actually fi uh, feasible. And then, just as I'm about to die, in the last few weeks, I have come to appreciate that a mathematical idea, which I believe von Neumann had long before any of these other things, um, may be a giving, a, a may be providing a description of what's called the Big Bang. That. Um, And in the draft of a paper that I've been working on for years, I have now put 
the name of von Neumann together with the name of Dirac and the name of a Russian mathematician named Gelfand all into the title and the Gelfand I'm sorry the uh, not Gelfand uh, von Neumann piece of mathematics relates to the Big Bang itself and I perhaps am incorrect in this, I can't be sure, but I believe a piece of mathematics he came up with regarding quantum theory uh, provides a, a more accurate way of giving meaning to this word Big Bang, which of course is a very loose term. And by the way, Gamow, I think, is the one who coined the word Big Bang as a joke. Gamow was a, a, a good writer, expositor, he was a, and uh, he liked to make jokes out of all sorts of things. And when this notion developed, I think it was Gamow who proposed the term Big Bang. So uh, to the extent that Gamow was very influential in my career, von Neumann probably never never heard of me. I mean, I can't think of any reason why von Neumann would even know I ex would have known that I existed. I mean, there I was computing these. I don't think he knew who I was. He didn't care. So, but um, it may be that uh, von Neumann's work provides a more accurate significance to the term Big Bang than has ever been achieved.